a conversation between Sewell and Dr. Vivek Murthy. Thank you so much, Teresa, for that very gracious introduction. It's truly an honor to be here today. I'm thinking about all the, uh, all the turmoil and, and stress that we've all gone through this year. And I, I you know, try to uh, feel grateful every day for something. And I feel tremendously grateful for this opportunity right now. Um, Teresa and Vivek and I were classmates and really our friendships go back you know, 25 years now. And uh, they've become more and more important to me the older I get. And I'm especially glad to be able to engage in virtual community across time zones, Miami, Dallas, Los Angeles. So thank you first of all for this opportunity. Um, Vivek, you became Surgeon General in 2014, the youngest uh, person to occupy that role since the late 19th century. Um, recent Surgeon Generals in more modern history have been associated with um, really syndromes and public health problems such as smoking and obesity. Um, you took on many priorities as Surgeon General, including of course working on the opiate crisis but uh, tell us a little bit about how you decided to, to make loneliness a focus of your work. Well, thanks, Sewell. And let me just say a thank you also to Teresa and to everyone who helped put this event together. Uh, you know, I've had the privilege of doing book talks over the last several months, but it is quite special for me to be able to do it with people I know and with, uh, with good friends like Sewell, you know, who I've known uh, and loved and admired for a very long time. And so uh, just really happy uh, to be here today to share this time. Uh, you know, the, uh, you know, it's funny to think back, for me to think back on, on how this journey started uh, because it really did uh, interestingly trace back to my time as Surgeon General, even though there were threads of loneliness in my own life long before that. Uh, but what happened to me is when I was, when I was Surgeon General, I, I had to, during my confirmation process, put forward a set of priorities uh, to the United States Senate as part of my confirmation process. And I did that. And, you know, if you looked at that list now, you would say, well, these all seem like perfectly reasonable uh, public health priorities. Uh, included things like substance, addressing substance use disorders and mental illness and violence, uh, particularly domestic violence. But nowhere on that list was the issue of, of loneliness and disconnection. Because in my mind, even though it had been a challenge for me, uh, you know, growing up and even in adulthood, it hadn't risen to the level of actually being a public health issue in my mind, but that turned out to be more a product of my ignorance than a reflection of reality. Uh, so what happened in the beginning of my tenure as Surgeon General is that I decided to, to go on a listening tour, and these are not uncommon, um, but I had gone through like a very long and colorful confirmation process that was marked by you know, a, a lot of a lot of politics and, and frankly, it, it was actually all but certain to not uh, actually go through. And so the fact that I was actually confirmed in the end uh, was really, uh, was unexpected, uh, you know, and, and it was uh, sort of necessarily not the prediction, but it was one of those like rare moments where we were able to get past uh, the politics and focus on substance. And so as I emerged into, you know, on the other side of that journey and began my role, um, I, I actually found myself I just ready to listen, you know, um, and I, I didn't want to actually go and do media and do like, you know, television shows and newspaper interviews. I can tell people what my agenda was. I just, I actually felt that I needed to be rejuvenated by actually going into the community and hearing from people and just re having them reset me uh, in some way. And that's actually what happened is like, as I, I traveled and I, you know, around to communities, I just asked people really just sim simple questions like, how can I help? What's on your mind? And I tried to shut up as much as possible and just listen. And I heard stories that wouldn't surprise you, stories about many of the priorities I had told the US Senate I wanted to address. But behind many of those stories were these threads of loneliness. And the way they cropped up was not by people approaching me in town halls and saying, hi, my name is Sewell, my name is Vivek, I'm, I'm lonely. Instead, people would say things like, you know, I, I feel I have to carry all of these burdens in my life by myself. There's no one there to, to help me or to stand with me. Or they would say, you know, I feel if I disappear tomorrow, nobody would even care. No one would even notice. Or they would say, I feel invisible. And I was hearing this not just from people who were living alone in nursing homes toward the end of their life. I was hearing this from college students on campuses where they were surrounded by thousands of people, from accomplished working professionals who worked in big cities, surrounded by many people in the workplace, but felt profoundly alone, including lawyers and doctors and even journalists, 
Uh, and I heard also from moms and dads who talked in almost hushed tones about the loneliness of parenthood and how it, they felt sheepish saying that because they were grateful for their child, but they found that parenthood, especially in the early years, was often a, a very lonely experience. And as I went from place to place, from whether I was talking to CEOs, whether I was talking to people in remote uh, you know, farms in the Midwest or remote fishing villages in Alaska, or even frankly to members of Congress, I kept hearing the same thing. And that's when it really struck me that there was something much deeper going on here than I had realized. It reminded me of my own experiences really struggling with loneliness as a shy, uh, introverted child. It reminded me of the loneliness I saw in the hospital and among my patients. But, but there it was uh, in front of me, uh, behind uh, so many of the conversations. But it just took a little bit of nudging, a little bit of permission given to a person or to an audience to address the issue of loneliness. And suddenly it was like the floodgates open and everyone seemed to have a story to tell. One of the distinctions you draw in your book is between loneliness on the one hand and kind of isolation and solitude on the other. Could you walk through, I always like to start with the definitions as, sure. we, as we get into the meat of the discussion. Could you talk about those distinctions? Absolutely. And, and this is actually, I'm glad you began there because loneliness is a subjective state. It's not an objective description of how many people you have around you. Uh, that objective term would be more like something like isolation, which is more uh, of, of, you know, again, a descriptor of how many people are around you. But you can be lonely um, and have hundreds and hundreds of people around you. You can not feel alone at all, even with a couple of people around you. What matters is the quality of your connections with other people. But loneliness in and of itself as a subjective feeling is defined, um, you know, by that time when you feel that the connections you need in your life are greater than the connections you have. And that gap we experience is loneliness. And finally, solitude. Solitude is actually a state of being alone, of not being with people physically around you. But what contrasts it from loneliness is that it is unlike loneliness, which is a state where we feel something is lacking. It's actually a state of pain and stress. Uh, solitude is actually a state of peaceful and almost joyful uh, aloneness. And you know, during this conversation, we'll talk about just how profoundly important solitude is, because it turns out, and this is counterintuitive, that solitude is actually important for us to be able to connect deeply uh, with other people. And I say that because we live in a time when solitude is in short supply, but also when many of us are in fact quite scared of being alone, uh, of alone with our thoughts, alone with, you know, and where we have to confront perhaps challenging things that are taking place in our life, but also alone in a way that makes us feel that perhaps we're socially broken in some way or that we're losers because we're not, you know, always hanging out with other people. Uh, being alone is, um, has become rapidly a lost art, but that solitude is actually incredibly important for us to ground ourselves, uh, to recenter ourselves, which in turn enables us to more deeply connect with other people. One thing I'm so struck by Vivek is the relationship between kind of physical health and health and mental health. Hmm. I think we've known for a long time that they're of course related and, um, there's been a lot of discussion about how the insurance system should should treat mental disorders, and I think a lot more awareness about depression and anxiety. How would you characterize the relationship between loneliness and depression and anxiety? Well, it's a great question, Sewell, because these are deeply interconnected. And let me say this, you know, to, to start. If you look around you, you might think to yourself, no one else seems to be lonely, right? Everyone else seems to have these amazing lives where they're hanging out on weekends or posting these, uh, these incredibly inspiring, you know, uh, you know, sort of uh, testimonials on social media talking about the great birthday party they went to or the great job they got. And, and it just seems like everybody is happy and connected. Um, but that's, th th that's actually a false impression for a couple of reasons. One is because of this stigma that surrounds loneliness often prevents us, right, from, from sharing uh, the fact that we are in fact struggling with loneliness. But the other challenge uh, with, with loneliness is that I think of it as the great masquerader. It can look like many different things, right? So we may stereotypically think of loneliness as the person sitting in a corner at a party all by himself or herself, or the person sitting alone in his or her dorm room without anywhere to go on a Friday night. But actually loneliness doesn't usually look like that. Loneliness can look like depression it can look like withdrawal. It can look like social anxiety. It can look like 
anger and short-temperedness, which is actually often how it presents in men, especially older men, um, it can look like many different things. And if we look around us and we ask the question, are there people around us who may be uh, experiencing depression or anxiety or who may seem uh, like their, their fuse is short, you know, and has been for some time, then the numbers are actually much greater than we think. Now, this is not to say everyone who's depressed is lonely or vice versa, but here's how they feed off of each other. When you feel, when you are experiencing depression, uh, you tend to withdraw more from other people. And, you know, and, you know, depression is a state where you also feel physically like your energy has been sapped uh, and you don't have the energy necessarily then to go out to pick up the phone and call other people. But that can actually plunge you into a deeper well of loneliness, often at a time when what you need, in fact, is the healing that comes from human connection. And similarly with anxiety, anxiety can prevent us from going out and engaging with other people as we may worry about how we're perceived or we may you know, misperceive other people's uh, you know, view of us or, or their intentions. Uh, and so anxiety can also uh, pull us deeper and deeper uh, into isolation. And as that happens, it can contribute to, uh, to loneliness. And similarly, the flip is true as well, which is that loneliness itself turns out to be a risk factor for anxiety and for depression. So the longer we experience loneliness, the more we're at risk for depression and anxiety. So while these are distinct entities clinically, and if you were to see a, a psychologist or a psychiatrist, they would likely try to decipher what exactly you're experiencing because they have slightly different strategies uh, to address, it turns out that these are in fact very deeply connected. And that means that it's not always easy to tell within ourselves what we're experiencing. And it's much harder uh, to look at somebody else and to predict um, what they're going through. With all of that said, I'll just lastly say this, that regardless of what you are experiencing, social connection can be deeply healing for all of these, for depression, for anxiety, and in the case certainly uh, for loneliness. And so there is no circumstance which, uh, in which uh, cultivating and leaning on trusted relationships is not helpful to us. Um, and that's actually why when I, when I came out of my time in government and when I was thinking about what to do with my life, I, I had a, you know, a small son, uh, Dejus, who was nine months old at the time. Uh, we were blessed to have another uh, you know, baby not that long after that. But it, it was, I was finding myself asking myself the question, like how, what can I do that might make the world a bit better for them, you know, for, for my kids, that would help address the deeper root cause of so many of the issues I dealt with uh, in office. And I kept coming back to this issue about social connection and loneliness because there is extraordinary healing to be found in our relationships. And that's been with us for a long time. But I do think that in the modern world that the power of relationships have often receded uh, into the background and have fallen on our priority list as work, as achievement have, have often risen to the top, not just of what we're supposed to do, but of how we define our self-worth and our value. You think your book contains a wealth of kind of empiricism. There are a lot of studies and meta studies uh, that are cited. What, some of the research that I found most striking was about the relationship between loneliness and longevity. Could you talk a little bit about how, you know, loneliness may be killing us? Yeah, so one, one of the things that's really interesting when you dig into the, the literature on loneliness is you realize it's more than just a bad feeling but it, it drives our health, our physical health and our mental health. And one of the fascinating studies that I came across and uh, you know, after I, I was clued into this being an issue uh, in office was the work of Julianne holt Lundstedt, a researcher at Brigham Young University, who in a large meta-analysis uh, that she did, a study of studies, if you will, pooling data from around the world, found in fact that people who struggle with loneliness uh, have shorter lifespans. And in fact, the mortality impact of loneliness appears to be similar to the mortality impact of smoking 15 cigarettes a day, and even greater than the mortality impact of obesity and sedentary living. And I remember reading that study, and, and I was still in office at the time, and I thought to myself, this office that I'm sitting in, the office of the Surgeon General, has for generations focused on these issues of smoking and obesity and sedentary living, yet we, never quite realized that loneliness may be just as important a public health concern as those other issues that we were working on. And so that, that was very striking to me. And it turns out Julianne's research is not the only one that has pointed to the profound health impact of loneliness. We now realize that loneliness 
it's associated with a, an increased risk of heart disease and dementia, as well as depression and anxiety, of sleep disturbances, and a host of other uh, you know, physical and mental health consequences. To what extent is loneliness baked into either American or more broadly Western culture? You have an entire chapter of your book that talks a little bit about connectedness across cultures and tremendously insightful stories about people from immigrant communities. Um, you talk a little bit about the Ethiopian community. You, you've spoken to people from uh, uh, as, uh, as far away as Australia. Um, and, and also um, you talk a little bit about migration. And I'm just curious about whether are there certain traits in our culture, and we'll, we'll get to technology and to COVID later in this conversation, but, but what about our culture? Uh, yeah, I'm also thinking about the uh, Indian diaspora of, of which you're a part, um, and also about um, you know, recent research about the resilience of the Latino community in the United States, which you know, sometimes has um, lower incomes, but a lot of social and family and community and intergenerational connections. Could you tell us a little bit about the role of culture in shaping a lonely society? I'm so glad you asked, Sewell, because it, you know, it turns out that our, you know, culture is an incredibly important building block for a society. And that feels like a truism to say, it seems like it should be obvious. But what's really interesting and what I find concerning is that there are core elements of culture that support healthy connections, but that haven't been emphasized or I think valued as much um, you know, in recent years. What I think of as a phenomenon that concerns me is less uh, specifically about American society, and it's more a feature of, I think, modern society, modern day society, whether you're focused on European societies, the United States, or even uh, emerging economies like, like, like India and, and other countries, which have taken on as part of their economic renaissance, uh, many of the trappings, if not substance, of um, of modern day culture. And what you find there is that there is a greater emphasis, I think, on the individual There's, uh, as opposed to the collective. Uh, there's a greater, I think, uh, uh, inclination to ascribe outcomes to individual effort as well, both good and bad outcomes. Um, even though we know that most outcomes are actually usually the product of collective effort. Um, but this is actually, if you think about it, a feature of modern society that's reflected everywhere, right? If you think about it, like who we, when, when we find a company that's done really well, we try to find the one person, maybe the CEO or the founder who's responsible for it. If you read the way we tell stories in books, uh, in newspaper articles and in conversation, right? We tend to look for the hero uh, who we can hold up uh, in, in any sort of fight. Um, and we see this very clearly in our politics as well. Or the villain. <laughs> or the villain, yes, absolutely, or the villain. But so, so much of it comes down to uh, the individual. But the other piece of it, which I think is, um, is really interesting and, and, and concerning is that in modern day society, I think we've also, we've, we started to make certain decisions, whether intentionally or not, about where our self-worth comes from, right? So we've defined our worth as human beings as success, Right? So I'm worthy, I'm valued as a human being if I'm successful. But then in turn, we've just defined success as your ability to acquire one of three things, either power, fame, or wealth. Or ideally, some combination of those three. And so if you think about the people that we hold up uh, as successful, they usually have um, achieved in one of those three categories. But that said, I would bet that almost all of us like on this call know someone or maybe you know many people who have achieved one or maybe all three of those parameters of success, but is profoundly unhappy and feels quite alone. Uh, I encountered many people like that when I was, uh, you know, in a surgeon general, but actually many in the years afterward as well, and still do today. But that I think is a profound challenge because in a world where you feel that your worth as a human being is defined by external benchmarks, uh, especially those external benchmarks. Um, you can start to feel that you're not worthy very quickly uh, if you fail, uh, especially if you ascribe any failure uh, entirely to your own uh, actions and, and flaws. And that sets people up uh, for a situation where they actually are quite disconnected from themselves. And by that, I mean where they don't have a strong sense of worth and value. Now, why is this so important for connection? Because it turns out if we are disconnected from ourselves, if we do not believe that we have much to bring to the world, uh, much to add to the world, 
we think that we're a failure and continually blame ourselves, it actually becomes very hard to build meaningful relationships with other people uh, because, well, we, one, it's a huge energy drain to constantly be feeling like you're not good enough. Uh, it takes a lot of emotional energy that we often don't even think about because like, think about this, like when you're not confident about who you are, when you're interacting with somebody else, you are constantly in your head going through how they're thinking about you. How are they perceiving you? Are you saying the right thing? Is your tone appropriate? That facial motion they made, was that a laugh? Was that a, a you know, it was a sign of approval or were they confused by what we said? Like you're constantly thinking about how you're perceived. Um, and that can be really draining, it can make interactions much, much harder. Um, now I'll lastly say this about modern society. And I think about this in particular in contrast to the society in which my parents grew up uh, in India. Um, my parents grew up, you know, in a society that was quite conservative in many ways, you know, culturally speaking, and they were not wealthy uh, by any means. My father, in fact, was, um, his family was so poor in the small farming village he grew up in that he didn't have actually anything to wear on his feet until he was 14 or 15 years old. The first time he wore slippers, um, he actually got a rash because he just was in a blister because he wasn't used to actually wearing it. Um, so they were really, really poor. But my father actually interestingly told me as I got older, he said he never knew what it meant to feel lonely until he left India. Because as poor as they were in terms of wealth, they were rich in relationships. Uh, they had family, nuclear family. They had extended family. They had family they weren't related to by blood, but they just took them in in the village because people had lived together for generations. Uh, there was a faith group, a religious group that they were part of. Uh, there were so many layers uh, that ensure that they were connected. Uh, and I think of those layers, those institutions, those family structures as the true social safety net, if you will, that keeps us deeply connected. But what's happened in, in the United States and many other uh, countries in the, in the industrialized world is that those institutions have eroded over time. Uh, Robert Putnam, uh, whom some of you may have taken his class when you were at Harvard, but he wrote eloquently about this in his book, Bowling Alone, uh, about two decades ago, and since then has actually chronicled that institutional participation, whether it's in faith groups or in community organizations, has continued to decline, uh, even since he, uh, he wrote his book. So that is part of the fabric of modern day society, which I think increases our risk of loneliness. And because we haven't recognized the price that we're paying in terms of not only health, but in terms of our productivity in the workplace, and our, how our children do in, the sc in school, all of which is deeply influenced by loneliness versus connection, I think we haven't taken the steps we need to to actually build the, the foundation for a more connected world. But that, I think, is the great challenge uh, and the great responsibility that we have right now. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about the events of this year. I mean, I think your book, you've been working on your book for several years, and I don't think any book in 2020 is kind of as timely and relevant as yours, Vivek. Um, when you were writing the book, you could not have imagined that we'd have the most significant public health crisis in the United States and probably, well, at, at least since, certainly since the AIDS crisis, but also in some ways in a century, uh, 200,000 Americans deceased um, and a tremendous degree of, of um, isolation, which is not the same as loneliness. Could you tell us, a, well, l let me start with one question. Um, um, Pew recently reported that a majority of Americans under 30 are living at home or living with their parents for really the first time since, you know, I think the, dep the, dep the depression. And I think the general, you know, take on this and certainly even from journal, you know, from journalists like, like me, you know, is, oh my gosh, this is kind of really a reflection of how bad things are. And, you know, in, and in many ways, I think that's true. People can't form households, you know, household wealth has deteriorated, obviously the vastly disproportionate effects on working people and people of color. But I wonder if the increase in intergenerational living, could that be a potential, I don't wanna say silver lining that's so glib, but could that be, could that have effects that actually are positive in terms of supporting community? It's such a great question, Sewell. And, and I actually don't think it's glib at all to, to think of it as a silver lining, because I think that's actually what we, we unfortunately have to do in this moment is to try to see in this time of crisis, what can we extract from this in terms of meaning, in terms of um, experiences that may actually enable us to come out stronger uh, and, and healthier and more resilient uh, in the future? Because you know what I worry about with COVID is not only how bad it's been, but how long it could go on. And the truth is that nobody really knows when the end of COVID 
uh, will, will come. Uh, they don't know when we'll be able to get back to pre-pandemic uh, ways of living. But you know what's really interesting, Sewell, is I find as I talk to many people, as stressful and painful as this time is, whether it's because you're worried about the health of your loved ones, if you've lost loved ones, or because you're worried about your children and their schooling, or you're worried about economic security, or you're worried about the state of dialogue and politics in our country, regardless of where the pain is coming from, there is great pain for all of us. Uh, but I think that the, what's happened for many people, I think, is as they've had to adjust their life, uh, I think many people I talk to are coming to certain realizations. Number one, the fact that they are not able to engage with and interact with people in the same way is making them realize just how much they relied on relationships, not just the relationships with best friends and close family, but even how much actually relation, interactions with strangers meant, uh, the, the warm hello that you receive from somebody you know, in a coffee shop, the, the pleasant smile you exchange with a stranger who's walking down the street, the, you know, the minute or so of conversation you might exchange with somebody in an elevator. These were all moments of human connection that as much as we may just glance past them and think that they're insignificant, they are actually very powerful in helping us feel not just better in the moment, but more connected uh, to the community in which we live. And so I think there has been a realization for many people that our relationships are, are much more important uh, than we had realized. I think the second point though is what you raised, Sewell, which is that many people have had to change their living circumstances during this time. Uh, I'm actually a prime example of that. In March, uh, my wife and our two small kids, Stages and Shanti, who are four and two and a half, uh, came down to Miami to visit my grandmother who had just uh, fractured her hip. And we decided, uh, and this is where I grew up, so I have my grandmother here, my parents, my sister and brother-in-law, but we decided to actually stay here at that time. Everything was closing down very rapidly. And we thought, well, you know, it's gonna be chaotic to be here. We're not gonna have uh, our usual childcare. We probably wouldn't have that in Washington DC either. Um, we won't have supports in other ways, but we'll have family and maybe, and it's much better to be with them than to be alone in a small condo in downtown DC. And so that decision we had to make in the snap, you know, uh, in a snap, so to speak, and we stayed here and it's been six months. And I, I can tell you this, that I never thought in my life that I would have this much time to spend with my parents again. And it's made me realize that as much as I had focused on quality of time, uh, when I had made visits down to be with my parents, there's something very powerful about quantity of time because quantity of time breeds quality of time. It's, those, it's what allows those conversations unexpectedly to bubble up, you know, when you're taking the trash out together or taking a walk around the circle, or it's what lets you observe um, what's actually happening in people's lives that they may not talk about. And I now see so many things that I hadn't seen before. I now recognize and feel a greater sense of urgency around being of greater service to my, to my family and to my parents in particular in ways that I, I had not fully, fully felt uh, you know, when I was living apart. So I actually, strangely enough, I feel a sense of dread about leaving this situation. And I haven't actually said that out loud uh, to anyone before. So it feels, it feels funny to say it, but, but it's true. Uh, and as, even as I'm telling you, I can feel like that sense of like, like anxiety start to rise inside of me as I think about the day that comes where we'll have to leave and I'll have to tell my two small kids that they won't be seeing their grandparents and jumping into their arms every morning when they wake up. Um, here's my hope for what we will all take away though from this, this period and what we will hopefully use it for. My hope is that we will be able to, uh, to use this time to actually step back and take stock of our lives and to ask ourselves what really matters in our lives? What gives us meaning? What brings us happiness? And I think very often we'll find that it's deeply connected uh, to our relationships. And if we do that, my hope is we can also take the next, next step, which is to double down on our commitments to the people in our life. Uh, and if that means making it a point uh, to call and speak to uh, our friends and our family more often, or reaching out, uh, looking for ways to serve uh, those in our life, recognizing that service is one of the most powerful antidotes we have for loneliness, or whether that's focusing on the quality of time itself, which is something we can do by eliminating distraction when we speak to other people, I say that as somebody who, you know, for many years, this, this device of mine, this phone, has invaded so many of my conversations with people. Uh, I found myself over time catching up with a friend and then somehow, five minutes later, I'm scrolling through my inbox, you know, or checking something on social media or Googling a question that came up or looking at the news. And I feel embarrassed to even say that um, out loud, but it's true. 
Um, but what I've realized is that uh, even though like these devices are built to do that, to like, you know, pull us in, that it actually does really dilute the quality of our interactions with other people. Even if you remember the words that somebody says when you're multitasking, you may have forgotten or missed entirely the nuance, the this flinch maybe that they, they may have expressed when they said something that indicated maybe there was a deeper pain behind it or the pause which indicated that they were nervous about something and needed you to actually push and go a little bit deeper. Uh, we miss a great deal, but my hope is that coming out of this pandemic, that we can ask ourselves that bigger question of how can we build more people-centered lives? How can we put people first in where we put our time, our attention, and our energy? And if we can do that, then I think we can enable ourselves to ask the bigger question, which is how do we build a people-centered society? One where we design our curricula in schools uh, in such that it gives our kids a chance to build healthy relationships from their earliest of ages, a, a world in which we design our workplaces to actually strengthen human connection, seeing that not as a waste of time and as a soft thing to do, but as a central piece of what we need to do to make sure our workplaces and the workers in them are healthy, resilient, and strong. You anticipated my next question, which was mm -hmm. is about technology. You know, on the one hand, I think we can all agree that gatherings like this one probably wouldn't have been, you know, much thought of as possibilities even six months ago. And I think that's the plus side, right? I mean, the, um, but I think the downside is we're spending even more time on our, on our screens. Um, I think so much, you know, I work in journalism, the flurry of news alerts, even during this talk, I'm muting my computer and trying to shut off my phone and I can feel the alerts coming in. How do we, you know, recognizing that technology is probably in some ways here to stay, what can we do to deploy it in the service of more humane ends and to use it to um, build connection as opposed to merely doom scrolling or, uh, or wasting time? Yeah, it's a good question, Sewell. And, you know, before I talk about technology, let me just say one last thing about your earlier question, which is, I do think, and I was looking at some of the questions that are popping up in the in the group chat, and this is relevant to the, to the last one, the uh, last couple that popped up. But there's something I think really important about redefining what time well spent actually is, right? I, I remember for many years feeling like if I wasn't being productive, if I wasn't in terms of work, um, if I wasn't building work connections, if I wasn't executing on projects, if I wasn't dreaming up new uh, endeavors to work on, that somehow I was wasting time, that I was falling behind in some way. And, and now I, I think about you know, this time where I've been actually, and being a, being a parent has actually forced me to, to move out of that mode in some ways, because like when you're, as many of the parents know like on this call, like when your child uh, needs you at bedtime, you can't be multitasking on your phone while you're trying to read him or her a story. Uh, when your child is melting down and, and breaking down because something has broken their heart, uh, you can't say, you know, I'll be there in five minutes. Let me just finish up this email. Like you need to be there. You need to show up. You need to be present. Um, but I see that actually in this time as a, as a deeper question that many of us, uh, you know, could push ourselves to really ask and to think, how can we reflect that in our lives? Like I now know at this moment um, in my life, being with my parents and seeing my sister and seeing everything that they're dealing with, that I want to spend my time figuring out how to make their lives a bit easier. Um, and at the risk of oversharing, I'll tell you that I, I, my mom will kill me if she knew that I was telling you this, but like, like I hear my mom, like, you know, on the phone a lot, like trying to figure out bills, you know, that come in or figure out like how to, uh, you know, organize like paperwork, you know, from, you know, various vendors that they have. And, and I think to myself, I don't want my mom to be spending all of her time doing this, you know, like at this stage in her life where I know what she really wants to do is to delve into her religious and spiritual pursuits. So to me now, time well spent is thinking, how do I offload some of that so that my mom doesn't have to think about the bills or have to think about calling these vendors to like resolve some issue uh, that came through on the paperwork? I don't know exactly how to do that yet, but that's what I want to spend my time figuring out. You know, I also know that time well spent is time just sitting with my father, you know, while he's, uh, while he's eating his breakfast, even if we don't say anything, to just be in each other's presence. Um, and the reason I want to make this point here is because I think that when we think about meaningful interaction with other people, we think about the words that are transacted. We think about the problems that we may help solve in another person's life. So if my friend is having a crisis and I can you know, jump in and intervene and provide some solutions, I'm like, okay, I added value. But that's actually only one way in which we add value. 
the other very powerful way that we add value is by being present with someone else, even if we don't say very much at all. Because all of us as human beings have, we have three key needs. We all want to, to, to be seen and understood for who we are. We all want to know that we matter and we all want to be loved. Regardless of what culture we came, come from, we all have those basic needs. And what's powerful about being with somebody fully present when you're giving them the gift of your full attention is that you say to them in those moments without your words that you matter because I'm here listening to you. I see you, I understand you, and that you are loved. That's the power of your presence. And so I mention this because I, I want us all to recognize that we don't always have to come up with solutions to our friends' problems to be a value uh, to them. We don't always have to fix our parents' lives in order to be a value to them. Simply showing up, being present, um, giving them our, our time and our attention and our energy can be extraordinarily valuable. And lastly, let me just tell you, say about technology, your question, so and I'm sorry about the, the diversion uh, that I went on. But the, the, what, what's interesting about technology is that, and this is the most common question that I would get actually uh, you know, on the road when I would talk about loneliness, is parents in particular would ask me, is technology hurting or helping our children? Is it making them more lonely? Is that what's going on? And what I would say is that tech in and of itself is not the problem. It's how we use technology uh, that really determines whether it strengthens or weakens our connections. Uh, I remember when Facebook first came on the scene, I remember using it to reconnect with so many high school friends to find people I had gone to school with but lost touch with. And then we actually were back in touch again. And then I would go visit them. And that felt like such a beautiful way to use technology to reconnect and to have meaningful conversation. But what I worry about, um, and I, sh I should say that's especially important now when we can't see each other as readily. Um, like if you can, for example, video conference with, with a friend and truly be present with them um, and talk to them and hear them and listen to them and share openly as well, that can be really powerful. You know, calling people on the phone, as old school as that seems, uh, you know, in the Zoom, in the Zoom era, um, is also incredibly powerful. You know what else is powerful? Leaving voicemails, right? And this is like, I, you, this seems like so passe, right? And like, if you call somebody, they don't pick up. You usually hang up and you text them, right? Or you figure out, I'll call them back later. But I learned from my good friend, Mark Berman, uh, who's a medical school classmate, uh, who used to always call me and they would leave these like one to two minute voicemails, right? Because we would always be playing phone tag. And I realized that in, when I would listen to those voicemails, I was hearing about his life, but I was also hearing his voice. And it, was, it made me feel so much more connected to him uh, than just you know, getting a text back and forth. Um, so we can use technology in ways that deepen our connection. But what I worry about is a predominant way that many of us, especially young people, are using technology are actually in ways that dilute their connections. They're either using uh, or in front of screens so much that it's crowding out their in-person interaction or high quality interaction, or they're allowing uh, their devices to intrude into their conversations and it's diluting the quality of the connection, or um, they're allowing, uh, not necessarily their fault at all, but they're, they're experiencing, I should say, uh, the erosion of self-esteem that so many people, especially young people, experience when they use social media and compare their lives to people's perfect curated postings. And also when they're receiving messages through all their various platforms that they're not enough, not skinny enough, not good looking enough, not rich enough, not famous enough, not popular enough. Uh, usually these messages are paired with an ad for a service or product that will help fill that gap. But nevertheless, um, being bombarded by that makes young people and all of us up at times feel like we're not worthy, uh, that we're not valued. Uh, and that in turn, has an impact on how we interact with others. Uh, if it's okay, I'd like to go to some of the questions from our audience. Um, Rebecca Poston asks, um, one question I've heard multiple times is what about pets? What's their role in combating loneliness? Well, pets are, I think, incredibly uh, helpful for, for strengthening connection. Um, they Look, there are, in a world where so many of us have baggage that prevents us from expressing our feelings and being open emotionally uh, with other people, uh, pets are remarkable in that they don't carry a lot of that baggage and they express love, they receive love uh, in ways that it can be profoundly healing. Um, with that said, uh, I do want to be cautious here that a, a pet is not a, a replacement for a person uh, entirely, uh, in that you cannot have thoughtful conversations uh, with your pet. And well, you can, but they might be one-sided. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and you can't have experiences that allow yourself to understand yourself 
uh, more deeply, you know, beyond a limited extent uh, with pets. So I think pets are, are wonderful. I've grown up with pets. Uh, we still have pets in my life. Um, but when someone says, you know, I don't need people in my life, I have pets, I get worried because I do think that there is uh, still a profound need that all of us have uh, for human connection, whether that's one relationship or many. Rebecca also asks in your book, you talked about how some schools have created welcoming environments to combat potential loneliness. What do you recommend to parents to help our kids recognize and combat the loneliness of kids around them? Which I think is such a profound question that of course there are new valences due to the online schooling that's going on right now that's adding a lot of burden to the lives of parents. Absolutely. And you know, in the book, there was an extraordinary um, program I came across that I wrote about uh, called the Beyond Differences Program, started by Laura Talmus and her husband, uh, A. Smith, in, uh, in the Bay Area, in Marin County. Uh, and it's a program that's spread around, all around the world, and, and it's focused on schools. And, uh, and then the gist of it is that it recognizes that many kids are, are lonely. And let me draw a distinction here between being lonely and being bullied. Because even though being lonely puts you at greater risk for being bullied, being bullied is actually an active uh, sort of experience, if you will. Somebody comes and they do something to you that makes you feel less than, uh, that makes you feel um, scared, uh, and it ultimately makes you feel small. But loneliness is often the experience of neglect. And this is something that Laura Talmas recognized with her own daughter, Lily, that it wasn't that people were bullying her daughter or being mean to her, but they just pretended like she didn't exist. Uh, they, there was nobody for her to sit next to at lunch. There was nobody who cared to play with her on the playground. Um, and so that neglect uh, that many children experience, um, that can contribute to loneliness. So what I think is important in a school environment is a few things. Is number one, uh, to talk proactively with children about loneliness so that they don't think necessarily that they experienced loneliness, that somehow it's entirely their fault or that they're broken or that they were, they were the only ones experiencing it. Um, the second thing I think it to do is to, is to actually try to draw boundaries around how we use technology. Because in, what's easy to do if you're struggling with loneliness is to actually quickly veer uh, into forms of interaction online, which require less and less vulnerability and less and less uh, actual engagement uh, with other people face to face. But that can actually lead to a deeper, uh, a deeper spiral of loneliness. And so what's important is that not to say you can never use technology for a child, but to have some healthy boundaries around it so that kids actually have the opportunity to interact face to face with family and with, with small groups of friends. But the last thing I would say, and this is more something for school administrators as well, is to think about the fact that kids, uh, when they're going through school, are actually learning how to relate to other children and how to build relationships. Uh, we shouldn't necessarily expect that they, they come into this world knowing all of that uh, and being able to execute it entirely. Uh, and so if we recognize that, then we recognize that you have to teach children how to read uh, you know, other people's body language as well as what they say. You have to teach them how to respond uh, in circumstances that are difficult so they don't lash out and instead they pause uh, and try to understand where somebody else is coming from. Uh, these are many of the things that Laura Talmus uh, helped teach children. Um, and I remember one of the girls I spoke to who had been through her program and is now actually, uh, she's not a girl anymore, she's a young woman in college. Um, she uh, told me that she realized through the program that subtle things that she could do with her body language in a group conversation would help uh, kids who were quiet in school feel more included because she was more facing more toward them and she was looking at them periodically. Little things like that make a big difference in how kids operate. And I think fundamentally children don't, they're not born uh, to be mean or wanting to bully other children or wanting to be little. Those are behaviors that they learn. I think intrinsically kids want to connect. Uh, they want to have healthy, fulfilling relationships. What they need are good role models. What they need are skills. And what they need are support you know, around them from parents who uh, help them rem remind them uh, that they truly do have worth and value, uh, regardless of what people around them may say. Teresa Chung has a fantastic question. In your book, you boil it down to three types of loneliness, intimate, relational, and collective. Could you um, exam, and, and audience, I wanna really assure you that although we've gone into some detail, the book is so full of insights, you need to read all of it. Um, what is the connection between these three types of loneliness and the health impacts? For example, would you say that one, that one of these three types of loneliness has a greater impact on physical health? Yeah, so th these three types of loneliness I found fascinating when I learned about them. And, and let me just, I'll tell you this, so in terms of why it's important to recognize this, because if you, 
are in a relationship and your partner is lonely, if you do not understand that there are three different types of loneliness, you will likely blame yourself for their loneliness. You'll think, gosh, well, if they were in a fulfilling relationship, they wouldn't be lonely. So it's got to be my fault or something's wrong with us. But it turns out that there are, in fact, different types of loneliness. So the first uh, intimate loneliness is when we lack connection with somebody we deeply trust, the kind of people we can truly be ourselves around, where we don't have to have any heirs. This could be you know, our spouse, it could be, uh, you know, a best friend, uh, you know, a close confidant, but, but that's, that's what, and when you don't have that, you experience intimate loneliness. The second type of loneliness is relational loneliness. When we lack the friendships uh, with people with whom we may get together on weekends or have over for dinner parties or barbecues or birthdays. And the third type of loneliness is collective loneliness. When we lack a community with which we share uh, a common identity or shared purpose, and that could be a faith group that you're a part of. It could be a volunteer group uh, you know, that brings you together around a passion for addressing a cause uh, or an injustice. It could be work itself. You know, if you have a community of people who are really passionate and driven by, by, by the mission and you connect with each other. But I'll, I'll use myself as an example, um, which is when I finished my service in government and came out, I was blessed to have a, a wonderful uh, wife and Alice um, and, and a wonderful relationship um, that taught me so much and supported me greatly. Um, but what had happened is I lost the, the, the community, if you will, that I had, which was a largely a community at work, a community of people I deeply enjoyed working with, we had, we were with whom we had shared purpose. But I also realized coming out that I had neglected many of my friendships during my time in government. I had convinced myself that, gosh, you know, I only have a limited amount of time here I want to do as much as I can and make as much of a contribution in these few years that I have. And I just continually and, and, and repeatedly kept putting work before relationships. And, you know, that may sound all like, you know, nice, you know, that yes, you want to like do as much as you can to, you know, in public service and to make an impact. Uh, you know, but those are the stories we tell ourselves. But the reality uh, is that when you, when you give short shrift to your relationships, even your work suffers. Uh, and you ultimately suffer. And I came out and recognizing that I had lost, um, I felt like I had lost many of my friendships uh, and that they weren't there. So I felt profoundly alone because, of, and it was relational loneliness, it was collective loneliness, but thankfully it was not uh, intimate loneliness. And I had my, my wife, I had my, my sister and my, my parents who were still there with me. Uh, and thankfully they understood that my loneliness was not a reflection on them. It was more there were other relationships in life that I needed, but that I didn't have. Is any of these types of loneliness most related to physical health? So I think actually that if I had to choose only one, uh, you know, type of relationship that I could have, it would be those intimate connections. Because I think that all of us, you know, coming back to those basic needs, we all have a need to feel like we're seen and deeply understood. And that requires us to be vulnerable. Uh, it requires us to be open, which is not an easy thing to do. Um, but when we're able to do that, it builds these profoundly satisfying, uh, close connections, and it allows us to be ourselves. Um, you know, very interestingly, you don't need to have like dozens and dozens of relationships like that. In fact, some of the work of Robert Dunbar, uh, Robin Dunbar rather, from the UK has, uh, has demonstrated that we actually can only have a few, a handful of those kinds of relationships on average five like in our lives where we have, you know, these truly intimate connections. And when we do have them, they usually take up 40% uh, or more of our social time. Um, so I, I say that because, you know, in, in the era of social media, it's actually easier to wish 100 people a happy birthday on Facebook than it is to take time out to have a long one hour conversation with your friend on his or her birthday. And that can feel like, wow, I'm being more efficient. I'm reaching out to more friends. I'm staying in touch with more people. But that's actually not how it is supposed to be, uh, because our intimate connections take time. They do that by nature, by design. But that's time, again, that's well spent. Eugenia Katsigris um, asks, do you see specific things on a public policy level or via other awareness building work of public health institutions that can be done to address the epidemic of loneliness? Yeah, you know, I think if we truly want to build a more connected world, and I believe that building a more connected world is the great challenge that we face in society right now, if we want better health, we want better education, if we want a better politics, uh, if we want better workplaces, then what we have to do is we have to, to recognize that every 
one, every institution has an important role it's going to play in rebuilding this connection. As individuals, for example, we can ask ourselves how to prioritize our relationships, not just with our time, attention, and energy, but not just with the people we love and already know, but we can ask how do we extend kindness and compassion to those around us who might be strangers we encounter for the first time or neighbors or community members we see every now and then. The ripples from our positive interactions are extraordinary. And in the book, I talk a bit about Wayne Baker and his work from the University of Michigan about um, the extraordinary power of relational energy uh, and how even interactions with strangers can fill our energy tank and power us in the workplace, in school and with our families. Um, but as institutions, I think we also have to ask as a workplace, how do I design my work setting to be more conducive to people understanding each other beyond their skill sets, to people helping each other, recognizing again that service is a powerful antidote to loneliness. I think it requires us to ask ourselves, what's really important in education for our children? Are we prioritizing their foundation for building healthy relationships as highly as we should? I think the answer is no, uh, generally speaking. But if we saw the data and understood just how powerfully uh, social emotional learning and unhealthy relationships determine and drive outcomes for our kids later in life, whether it's academic outcomes or job performance or health, we would be investing a lot more in that. But finally, I think when it comes to our politics, this is so important, it's really timely, because there are a few people that I have met around the country who believe that the state of dialogue in our country is healthy. In fact, there are many people around the world who, who feel that in their countries, they're seeing dialogue deteriorating. I see that when I talk to people from the UK, from India, from France, from Germany, from many other parts of the world. And I think that if we recognize that, what we have to recognize is there's actually a deep connection between our relationships with each other and our ability and our politics. Because it turns out that when we have a relationship with somebody else, whether that's a relationship we've built over the last 10 minutes or over the last 10 years, we're actually more able to listen to them, to pause and give them the benefit of the doubt, uh, to give them a shot at and, and understand like their point of view, even if it's very different from what ours is. And that actually is what drives healthy dialogue. So it turns out that relationship is the foundation for dialogue. And this idea that we can somehow just take people who have different views and throw them in the same room and hope that they find common ground, like intellectually, that's just not how we work as human beings. We seek to find human connection first, because that's what builds trust. And then when we trust, we can actually start to really talk and we can really dialogue. And so I do think that, you know, as we look at the world around us, we recognize that loneliness is not just a health issue. Loneliness is actually a deeper societal issue. And if we want to build a healthier, stronger society, then we've got to recognize that we have to start at the foundation. And that foundation is built on our relationships with one another. Um, Vivek, that's so relevant. I mean, I feel that it's, I think in my work a lot as an opinion, as an editor of opinion journalism about whether we're reaching people or if they're just so set in their information silos. And I'm curious in traveling the country, whether, you know, you've been able, you feel you've been able to reach people who, you know, maybe of different political beliefs, but, but kind of see the humanity in your book and that it's touched them in some way. Has it, do you feel that there's been an ability to empathize or cross? different kinds of communities, different times, kinds of belief systems? Yeah, you know, so this is, I wrote this book initially wanting to understand loneliness, but I came out of it just incredibly inspired by the power, the healing power of human connection. And that's what gives me hope. Because as I've traveled around the country and talked to people around the world, what I've seen so so clearly is that as human beings, we are hardwired to connect with one another. And so many people are hungry for that connection, regardless of where they are on the political spectrum and regardless of where they are in the age spectrum as well. Some of the people I've talked to who are most hungry for connection uh, are high school and college students who find themselves connected all the time through technology and not really enjoying the kind of relationships uh, that they truly crave uh, inside. And so I think there is a common hunger uh, that reflects a deeper need that we've evolved uh, to, to have as human beings over thousands of years. You know, our, our connection with each other is not just an accident. It's not just a nice to have. It's something that over thousands of years has been essential for our survivals, uh, survival when we were hunter-gatherers and even now, like in the modern age. And so I, I do feel 
that there is tremendous interest in this particular moment uh, at rebuilding our connection with each other. People may not always know how. They may worry at times and feel scared uh, and pessimistic about whether it can really happen, uh, that we can actually come to focus on our relationships and rebuild our connection with each other. But make no mistake, the hunger is there uh, because there is no issue that I worked on during my time in office, including the opioid epidemic, including e-cigarettes, including Ebola and Zika. There's no issue that resonated as deeply with people around the country as the issue of loneliness and social connection. So if you are feeling lonely, you are certainly not the only one. But if you understand more about this topic and something tells you that there is within this, you know, the, uh, the, the substance, the ingredients, if you will, um, for building a connected world, for fixing so much of what ails us, then I would say that you're not alone because there are many other people who instinctually, you know, have, I think, felt the same way. Teresa, if you'll allow two final questions from um, the audience, if that's okay. Um, one um, from Susan Mays. Um, other than family, what are the solutions in today's America for community? You know, schools push clubs, but they could be short-lived or superficial. Religion, you know, may be waning as a force for organizing people. Geographical community, you know, so can feel gone. Uh, it's a huge question, but what are some thoughts that you have about, about community? Well, it's a great question, Sewell. And, uh, you know, I think that there are institutions that were strong in the past that probably could be revitalized and strengthened again. Um, I think faith communities are among those, um, but certainly not the only ones. But I think we're also in, in, a, in a place where we need to think about new communities and in some cases draw from uh, maybe unfamiliar traditions to some of us. Like, you know, one of the traditions I found to be incredibly inspiring on a personal level was the institution of the Moai, something that Sewell, you and I were talking about just before this call began. Um, that old, the ancient uh, Okinawan uh, tradition of bringing children together and putting them in small groups from a young age and saying, these are your people. Not to say these are the only friends you'll ever have, but to say this is the, a group you're going to be particularly committed to. You're going to look out for each other. You're going to help each other. You're going to make sure each other's okay. Um, and at, a, at the, you know, the time in my life two years ago when I was struggling with, with really deep loneliness, I, um, I built a Moai with two very close friends, uh, with Sunny and, and Dave are, are their names. And a Moai where we made a, a very simple commitment to one another. Uh, you know, we had been good friends for years, but rarely saw each other. But we said, going forward, once a month, we're going to make a commitment to do a video call with each other. And during that call, we're going to just be fully present. We're not going to multitask. The second thing we said we're going to do is we're going to be real with each other. We're going to talk about the stuff that actually matters, the things that are on our mind, even if it's hard. We're going to talk about the things we don't usually talk about with friends, like our relationships, our health, our finances. Um, and the last thing we said is that we're going to be there available for each other. And that when things come up, uh, when we, if we have a crisis, that we'll just text the others. We just have a simple group uh, text thread. Uh, and that if that means that we can get on the phone for five minutes, we'll do it. Uh, because five minutes, uh, it turns out, can, can mean a great deal when you're fully present with one another. And I'll tell you that over the last two years, Sewell, that Moai has changed my life. It's enabled me to, to feel, frankly, like I belong, like I'm more deeply connected than I did before. It's helped me feel and remember like who I am in those inevitable moments where I, when I forget. Uh, it's reminded me of what matters in life, which are relationships with other people. Final question from our audience. Have you explored loneliness in terms of grief? How does isolation following a significant uh, trauma or traumatic grief or loss situation unfold, especially for those who may not have been isolated before the event? Can the impact of loneliness be different in that situation? It's such a, a great question. and and. Sadly, a question that so many families are asking in this age of COVID when more than 200,000 people have been lost and many more affected. Um, but the, the loneliness that comes with grief is, um, can be quite profound and can be quite debilitating uh, for, for many people, especially if they've had a deeply connected life before that and the feelings of loneliness may be fresh and new. Um, but what's especially important, I think, in those moments uh, when we're experiencing that loneliness is is for the people around us, uh, the people around the one who may be grieving, uh, to recognize that their presence, that their relationships are more important than ever before. Uh, there are so many times in times of grief when, when we shy away from engaging with other people because we tell ourselves the following. We say, well, they need space, so we're just gonna give them their privacy. Or we say, well, we don't really wanna 
intrude because we're not really family. So we'll just wait for them to reach out when they're ready. Or, or we say, you know, it feels a little awkward. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to fix it and make it better. So I'm just not going to go over and, and visit or I'm just not going to call. Um, and let me just tell you that those instincts are rarely correct. Uh, and I say this rarely because, yes, there are some circumstances where, uh, you know, people want to be alone, you know, and they need some time to grieve. But being present with somebody doesn't mean that you need to be fixing all the time or that you need to be talking all the time. Uh, simply being there with them. Maybe you go over to someone's house and you just, they're in the bedroom and you're in the kitchen cooking and making something for them, but they know that you're there and you care. Uh, maybe you call and leave them a message just to say, I'm thinking of you. You don't have to call back if you don't want to, but I want you to know that I'm thinking of you and that I love you and that I'm concerned about you. Um, maybe you send them uh, something very small that reminds them of you. There are so many things that we can do to be present in other people's lives. And it's deeply needed uh, you know, in times of grief because in times of grief, we, we can forget who we are because we can attach so much meaning to the relationship that we lost, meaning which is often well ascribed, that it can often feel like some part of ourself has drifted off as well and has been lost and is not recoverable. But this is what friends do. You know, when I was in, in college, I asked a good friend, I said, tell me what your definition of friendship is. And he paused for a moment and he said, a friend is somebody who reminds you of who you are when you forget. And we all forget who we are. We all forget that we bring light to the world. We all forget why we have value and worth. And we need friends around us as mirrors to show us who we are in those moments. And grief is one of those really profound moments. You know, I know that this is our, our last question. So I, I just want to sort of say in closing that, um, you know, speaking about all these topics with you feels it feels especially meaningful, not just because of the moment that we're in with COVID, but because this community of, you know, of Harvard alums and some Yale alums reminds me of the community that I had at Harvard and at Yale, um, you know, community that became ex increasingly important to me, you know, as I went through my life. Um, but a community that I also look back on with some regret, because I realized, especially when I was in college, uh, when I was at Harvard, that I didn't put nearly as much like time, attention, and energy into my relationships. I was a very like cloistered person because I was not because I didn't want to interact with people, but because I was shy and I was I was very uh, I was a nerd among nerds. I was very constantly studying and in Cabot Library and um, God Cabot Library. Oh my God, and uh, and Lamont Library, which in particular I have trauma over because I spent so much time there, you know, for history books and doing all the reading because I was a freshman. Didn't know you didn't have to do all the reading. Anyway, the point is that I, I was I didn't have a, a ton of of uh, and nearly as much community as I, as I could have had. And I, when I look back on college, people always ask me like, oh, what would you do differently if you did college again? Would you study abroad? Would you do this? And the one thing I keep thinking of is I would have spent more time with the amazing people uh, that I was blessed to meet, uh, but just wished I had um, you know, deeper connections with. And I was blessed to have you know, a friendship with Sewell you know, when I was in college, one of the few people um, that, that I had a close friendship with. But um, but I do think I look at this community and I feel a sense of deep gratitude. Um, you know, my work on all of this is, um, it's deeply personal. Uh, you know, when my wife and I four years ago, four and a half years ago found out that we were pregnant with our son, uh, you know, we were elated. I actually still remember coming home and looking at the pregnancy uh, test indicator and seeing that it was positive and just thinking, oh my God, our lives are gonna change. And so much is going to be different uh, in this moment and feeling a sense of fear and excitement and everything all at the same time. But in the days that followed, I remember also being worried, uh, worried as I watched the news. And in 2016, we had so many, uh, you know, episodes of racial injustice that made the news and that forced so many of us to ask the deeper question of what kind of society are we living in and can, how can we do better? And I looked at so much of the, the meanness on social media and so much of the brokenness in our politics and the bullying in our schools. And I asked myself, like, what kind of world are our children going to go up, grow up in? Uh, especially my, my son, who is uh, hopefully going to be joining us soon in, in, in a few months. And I, did, I recognized in that moment that as overprotective a parent as I am, that I can't, I can't on my own fix the world or, you know, in some, uh, in some way, I can't ensure that everyone is kind and compassionate. I can't do any of that. And I can't be around uh, when my child is interacting with everybody. 
But what I can do, and what my wife and I made a commitment to doing, like on, on that day uh, when we found out we were going to be parents, is we made a commitment to do everything within our power to try to tip the balance of the world away from fear and towards love. And we did that because we realized that those two forces are ultimately what's driving what's happening in the world today. And that fear may be manifesting as insecurity and anger and jealousy and rage. But we also see love manifesting as generosity, as kindness, um, as, as love. And what I have realized, even in my own life, is that when I make decisions that are driven by love, when I come from a place of love in my interaction with other people, uh, especially people with whom I disagree, that I feel better and things turn out better. And the real question is, how do each of us do that in our own way? How do we put our hands and our hearts on that scale and tip that balance toward love? And I've realized that we have to do it by choosing what we say and how we treat other people, by choosing what we uh, decide to speak up about in the public square, by who we vote for at the ballot box, by what decisions we make about our career and our work. Um, this is the work I believe uh, that challenges our generation, the work to make our world better, but to do so in a much more fundamental way than passing a single policy or electing a single candidate. This is about us. It's about the fabric that we lay down right now that will help build that foundation for a stronger world. And if we do so in a way that drives forward the values of love and compassion and kindness, if we teach that to our children, if we model that in how we live and inhabit the world, then I believe that we will build that foundation for that more connected, more fulfilled, healthier, stronger, more vibrant world that so many of us desperately want for ourselves and certainly for our children. Thank you, Vivek, for these incredibly profound and meaningful remarks. Teresa? Thank you so much, uh, Sewell, for joining us and Vivek for sharing with us. Um, I think your message, on the one hand, it resonates with us. There's, these are messages we've heard before and things perhaps we've heard and we know, but at the same time, I think the way you link it and the, how you explain the why and the fundamental important, importance is really kind of revolutionary. Um, and so I thank you for joining all of us and sharing with us your profound thoughts. Um, and thank you everyone who was able to join us and participate today. I encourage you all again to read the book together. I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. Thanks so much, Teresa. Thanks, Sewell. Thank you everyone so much.